How will we address the climate crisis? Climate One with Greg Dalton brings together advocates, influencers, and policymakers in empowering conversations that connect all aspects of the climate emergency, the individual and the systemic, the scary and the exciting, to help you understand the most critical issue of our time. Because addressing the climate crisis begins by talking about it. crisis can feel distant, like it's someone else's problem, until your town is flooded, your home is damaged by storms, or you're struggling to pay electricity bills as the summers get hotter. Figuring out the specifics of how a region is vulnerable to climate impacts can be the difference between adaptation or disaster, especially for communities that don't have a lot of climate or environmental expertise among their members. Natasha Udugama, Daniel Wildcat, and Angela Chalk are all working at the forefront of community science. Hear our conversation today on Climate One. In 2004, uh, an earthquake in the Indian Ocean caused a tsunami that hit several nations in Southeast Asia, Thailand, Indonesia, mm -hmm. uh, killed 230,000 people, and is the most deadly natural disaster, I think, in the mm -hmm. 21st century. You uh, went to Sri Lanka. What did you see there, and how did that shape the work you're doing now? When the 2004 tsunami struck Sri Lanka, and I was very much called to wanting to be of support to, you know, extended family back home, some, some in fact who had lost their lives, uh, and wanting to give back to the country. So uh, I decided to leave my paying job here in the United States to find opportunities there in 2005. Um, and that was following a reconnaissance visit that I'd sort of instigated with um, Virginia Tyke. And we went, we did a lot of trips, we m met a lot of people, but we didn't necessarily get proje a project that we had anticipated getting. Um, and so I sat back and kind of realized, you know, I, I really do want an opportunity to work there, but I didn't know how that was going to happen. So I had a, a pile of cards. I took that, I took the first card off, and it was the executive director of one of Sri Lanka's largest community-based organizations, and I reached out to him. Mm -hmm. And literally five minutes later, I kid you not, he wrote me back and he said, you know, we need people like you. We'd really like you to come out and, um, you know, we'll send you a ticket. Mm -hmm. Your homeland was calling you. <laughs> that's yeah. right, that's right. Mm -hmm. So it was just like following this unction, and you know, the thing is, um, the, the, the ancient Arabic word for Sri Lanka is serendip. Um, so that's where the word serendipity comes from. Mm, and so I, cool. I like to think that, you know, my work is serendipitous. Um, I also feel like it's also faded. So. Mm. <laughs> right. And so now your organization, Thriving Earth Exchange, connects communities with science and supports them together to tackle local challenges. Over 250 projects in 15 countries. You know, but how does it actually work? You know, how does that, you know, how do you connect science with yeah. local communities? It was just kind of seen, yeah. It's a great question. So community science is, and, and as per AGU, Thriving Earth Exchange, community science is defined as communities and scientists working together to address community priorities related to climate change, natural hazards, natural resources, environmental health, pollution, sustainability, and resilience. So everything between the core of the earth mm -hmm. and the surface of the sun and everything in between are what are over 350,000 members and affiliates in 147 countries are able to do. So we connect communities who have these priorities to, to, to scientists who are interested in working with them to advance those community priorities mm -hmm. so that they can develop feasible and impactful tools and solutions for those local places, mm -hmm. for those neighborhoods, um, and really provide access to the science that they have never had the opportunity to have um, or have not necessarily had the opportunity to work with hand in hand. So, since 2015, we've had partnerships, what we call community serving organizations. So these are organizations like ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability, the International City and County Managers Association, uh, and others who basically boast networks mm -hmm. of cities, communities, neighborhood groups, uh, and then I would say in 2017, our connection with the Anthropocene Alliance has really helped us to uh, exponentially support more marginalized, underserved communities. And since then, I would say the, our reputation of being able to support communities in a very authentic way 
has really enabled more communities to come mm -hmm. to us through word of mouth, mm -hmm. um, which is yeah. exciting. Angela, what did you see in your proud seventh ward there the, that, that led you into community science? Well, for us, it was the lack of trees and uh, mm. the, the extreme heat that we were experiencing long before the summer of 2023. Uh, in working with the researchers that I was connected with, uh, Dr. Derek Van Burke of the University of Michigan and Dr. Amy um, Lesson of Dillard University, my alma mater, <laughs> um, we were able to come up with the project of reforesting a four by two square block area mm -hmm. to measure surface temperature and in planting trees. And so to date, we've planted 740 trees, 30 of which went in yesterday, <laughs> <laughs> and another 200 to go in um, later this planting season. And as a result of that, we were able to issue real-time heat alerts through a weather station that's located in the seventh ward. And for us to gather data, there are sensors that are strategically located within that research zone. As a result of that also, um, we're able to leverage funds from other philanthropic organizations to be able to plant m greater trees and greater size and, and diameter. What Dr. Van Berkel is doing at the University of Michigan is developing a tracking tool so that we can uh, monitor the size of the trees, the species of trees, the rate of growth, and whether those trees are surviving or not. And Dr. Lesson works on the social aspect of, of what urban heat means to people, um, how we are working with each other, and, and when, it's, when it's hot, how do, how do folks do their daily essential activities? What does that mean for people with chronic diseases such as respiratory illness? And so what came out of that when we planted this um, second set of trees was right at COVID is that residents in the neighborhood started saying to me, because I live in a neighborhood where people know each other for generations, um, they started noticing the calming effect that the trees had on them during the COVID epidemic when mm. we were all um, mm. quarantined. Mm. And so the benefits of trees are not only from the, the aspect of reducing um, urban heat and increasing the canopy, but it's the social aspect of it. Um, it's the aspect of it when we look at it with managing storm water, how trees uptake water when we're planting native trees as opposed to just ornamental trees. And so community engagement was was of the utmost important aspect of that because neighbors were able to learn more about native trees as opposed to just a tree. And so now everybody in my neighborhood is a tree expert. <laughs> that they can tell you the species of native trees that they want plant in front of their homes in the public right away. And when I tell you everybody's a native expert, I mean a native tree expert, they can tell you down to the, the, the growth of the tree, the, if it's deciduous or evergreen. And uh, most folks will now want the flowering trees, um, the Chinese Taiwan cherry, which we know that we're on the same parallel with those other countries, so they can mm -hmm. go that, that far to tell you that we're on the same parallel with other countries, that these trees will grow specifically in our area and uh, are adaptive to our climate. Mm -hmm. um, and that only comes from being engaged with residents to provide mm -hmm. that community education. Lots of those trees, uh, yeah, cooling, calming, and all <laughs> sorts of yes. benefits of those trees and monitoring them. That's just like not like planted and they're done. It, <laughs> you have to like keep them going but we're able to hire folks from workforce development and then local contractors, African-American contractors that are from the neighborhood to be able to plant those trees. So we're creating a circular economy as well as reducing um, the urban heat island effect. Mm -hmm. Triple win, something like that. Dan, I recently watched a, a video a talk you gave on indigenuity. Mm -hmm. Tell us, that's a new word for me. And I'm, okay. And I'm tell, what does it mean to you? I'll explain it. Well, in indigenuity is, is, has a lot of pieces, but the simplistic description of it is it's basically taking indigenous knowledge and wisdom and applying it to solve very contemporary problems, modern problems. So uh, it disabuses people of the fact that uh, when you talk about indigenous cultures, indigenous knowledge systems, some people think that's all about the past. No, these are living systems. These are living intellectual systems. They're spiritually connected to 
all of life that surrounds us. We live in the age of the Anthropocene. So far, and human-centered Earth has not been very good for the balance of non-human life on this planet. And I think the advantage of indigenous knowledges is they are decidedly non-anthropocentric. So for me, I don't think of a wild cat as an animal, I think of it as a relative. I carry that name. That is embodied in many native cultures where mm. people's clans are identified with the animals, the plants, features of the natural world that they share. Not romanticism, that's indigenous realism. In fact, it's more consistent with modern science than a lot of other views that what people think about things. We're all related. So indigenuity is a way of thinking about how we address the problems that we face now, remembering that it's not all about us. We have a lot of teachers out there, that water, the land, the air, the plants and the animals. In Zoya Ha traditions, those are relatives and they are teachers. They can teach us something if we pay attention to them. So I think, you know, those are features of indigenuity that I think are, are desperately needed today. We're talking a lot, you know, in community science, those of us that are working in the area of global climate change, about finding a new lens, a way in which we can understand the world. And the beautiful part of indigenuity is, it is by its very nature, okay, um, non-hegemonic. There is no indigenous view, per se. There's a Choctaw view, there's a Seminole mm -hmm. view, there's a Haudenosaunee view, there's a Miwok view. You're not, a, you're not monolith. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, because, because the knowledges are shaped by that unique relationship between a people and a place. So indigenuity would suggest to us that if we want to address climate change, don't be looking for that one magic pill or bullet. We're going to have to apply different solutions in different places because we all know climate change will manifest itself differently in different places. Right, yeah, it is, and it's, it's unequal, it's unfair in lots of ways, you know, the global north, certainly. Exactly. Uh, you know, where trees are or not is, mm -hmm. is, is related directly to redlining where banks lend and didn't lend. Yeah, and, and as we talk about that, um, you know, no one likes to discuss the, the elephant in the room about racism. Mm -hmm. And it's not unheard of for, as you speak about with redlining, mm -hmm. about why communities are the way they are. And in my community, it's, it's we were on Lord, we were on what was once swampy land, but it was undesirable land. It was cheap land for people to be <clears throat> able to purchase. Um, and at at the and currently now it's it's by design I, in my opinion that we don't have these tree line avenues that perhaps the more affluent sections mm -hmm. of New Orleans did and mm -hmm. we once did along the North Claiborne Avenue corridor we once had thriving oak trees similar to what we all see on St Charles Avenue mm -hmm. but because of urban development the interstate system the I ten system came through and clearly wiped that out mm -hmm. at, um, during the, 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 I can remember during the 60s, um, when, when the interstate came through and just moved people out. This North Claiborne Avenue corridor was a bustling African-American um, business corridor. It's, mm -hmm. it's cut off. It remains cut off. And now how people talk about taking the I-10 down, mm -hmm. but what do we do now? Because there are things that we can do to mitigate that. And that's, that's involving the community to say, hey, this is what we want in our community now based on the atmosphere and the climate that we're dealing with now. And we use the analogy when people don't want to talk about racism and environmental justice. We have to talk about it because folks say that, oh, it's so traumatizing. Well, it's traumatizing to the people that live there because we live it every day. But it's, it, it's something that has to be said because without the friction, to move it forward, to change. If you have a flat tire, mm -hmm. if you don't continue, if you continue on with the friction <laughs> and ignoring it, you're going to continue with a flat tire. 
But when friction's we, necessary yeah, for movement friction, and progress. Yeah, friction, yeah, friction <laughs> is necessary for movement and change. And so as a as black woman growing up in a black community, we have to have that friction to bring attention in order for there to be change if what we say is true about all of us being equal. And, and actually, in my mind, I don't want equality. I want equity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's a difference. And so mm -hmm. people need to understand the difference between um, equality and equity mm -hmm. so that we all can thrive and be and have a, a just life that's promised to us. We are promised, <laughs> endowed by certain un unalienable <laughs> rights that all men are created equal. Then we want this in our communities, and um, it, particularly now, and I can only speak from the black perspective. Black communities now realize, especially with the trillions of dollars of federal investments, that we are the ones that are in the driver's seat that can that can dictate the way our communities are changing. And we no longer want to be studied or extracted. We want to work with scientists to understand our communities mm -hmm. so that we can come up with real solutions for our communities. Mm -hmm. So the, the, no longer are the days where you come in and extract information and distract right. us from the real issues. We want to be at the table and working with scientists to resolve mm -hmm. our issues, and that's what Thriving Earth mm -hmm. has done for my community. Mm -hmm. Natasha, one project you're working on is Cook County, Georgia, where a new plant creating wood pellets is proposed. Wood pellets are used to put into furnaces, sometimes to replace coal, sometimes with coal. Mm -hmm. The community there doesn't want that. There's resistance there. Can you talk about that one or another one where, where communities are trying to address the, the justice that Angela has talked about? Back in... 2017 in Evanston, Illinois, the, um, a, an environmental justice community mm -hmm. just outside of the waste transfer station in Evanston, Illinois, was very concerned about the impacts uh, that waste transfer station was having on the health of the community. A lot of those mostly black, poor, underserved areas of, that, of Evanston were basically suffering from asthma and other health effects of the waste transfer station. And so they, um, you know, really banded together. Luckily, they had a great sustainability coordinator who was very um, open, and they had an environmental justice committee in that community in Evanston that was very active. Mm -hmm. So they were actually part of the vetting of the scientists that we put forward. I recommended some scientists, mm -hmm. and they said, okay, we'd love to be able mm -hmm. to be part of this selection. Um, and so, um, that I think because of that, they had even more support from the entire community. And um, eventually they were able to set up air quality monitors around the waste tran transfer station. Um, the scientists who were selected to be on this project were eventually selected by the mayor of Evanston to be on the climate committee. Um, and so, and they were able to find subsequent funding where they were able to actually start keep those um, air quality monitors going over time. And the scientists have built that trusting mm -hmm. relationship. Yeah. So just as Dan was saying about, you know, having these solutions really, really focused on different communities, mm -hmm. that is what Thriving Earth Exchange is helping to do. Mm -hmm. And we're not just trying to do this in a way that just ha does one-offs. We put everything up online. We try to, re as much as possible, document every single process to the extent possible. And we make sure that you know, all these processes are online and are available to other communities so that when they come, they can take a look at what are those solutions that are out there, what has been developed by other communities, so that they can replicate, adapt it as necessary, and then make it and tailor it to their community. And that's, yeah. that's where the funding also, funders really need to understand that it, it takes time to build these relationships. Mm -hmm. We can't just get funding to do work with communities and expect to have you know, the results um, in a year or two, mm -hmm. you know? Science and technologies that, it, you know, that science has spawned have a long history of harming mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, vulnerable communities being extractive mm -hmm. and using certain communities as as guinea pigs. <laughs> um, Dan, how about you? You know, science can undo past harms without causing new ones. I think we I think we've misvalued technology. We treat technology as if it's the, it's it's a variable that's going to solve everything. And what we've seen is that what has the anth the age of the Anthropocene taught us. The most of our technologies have unintended and latent consequences we weren't smart enough to see, i.e., case in point. I am 
at this point very concerned about artificial intelligence yeah. because artificial intelligence is machine intelligence. I'm not a machine. And it's being designed by a bunch of white guys. Well, it seems like it at this point. <laughs> and, and I think that's part, of, that's part of this mindset that technology is going to save us. I'm not anti-technology. Let's revalue it. So I came up with an algorithm several years ago, and I said, well, what technology should be equal to is the three C's over E. Community, culture, communication over environment. You should always have a positive value. If that community is strengthened, communication is strengthened, and culture is strengthened in that relationship between a people and a place, that's good technology. I can point to a number of technologies, as everyone in this room can, that have been very destructive to people's mm -hmm. culture, their community, and don't we all know about the damage of what's happened to human communication in the age of the internet? Hmm. Bad actors can yeah, make things bad are things happen. Yeah, the internet, I was a reporter at the early days of the internet, it was supposed to democratize exactly, all sorts yeah. of things in communication, and it's now kind of controlled by a powerful few. Um, uh, Natasha, we hear about decolonizing science. I'm not sure what that really means, but, <laughs> but um, how can science, you know, advance with while undoing past harms? Well, interestingly enough, we were talking about pub, pub, par, publish or perish, right? Yeah. Um, my my PhD thesis was called partner or perish. So I think it's really important <laughs> it. yeah. that we partner and yeah. we partner authentically. Um, so I think that's part of decolonizing science is really having, as Angela was also talking mm -hmm. about, these really trusting mm -hmm. relationships, you know, and mm -hmm. having deep partnerships, really getting to know people, connecting authentically. I mean, one of the things that has helped me in my career is making true, authentic mm -hmm. connections mm -hmm. with people, mm -hmm. you know, and I think like really taking the time to really understand, you know, the communities that you are working with, the people, the individuals themselves, where they're coming from, their context, their knowledge, um, and having the opportunity to, um, you know, having the opportunity from funding agencies to do that, I think is also, mm -hmm. you know, a huge part of it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't just mm -hmm. do that. Uh, you can do that for, for ad nauseum, I guess, and then you might not get paid to do it. Um, but I'm hopeful, you know, as we, um, you know, as these conversations continue to happen, as this work is continuing to explode, and it is starting to explode, which is really exciting, um, that we will have more opportunities to have, to make these authentic connections, mm -hmm. to really be able to um, you know, overcome some of the, you know, adverse effects of maybe bad technology, but mm -hmm. um, by making sure that we, and I think we're in a new era, right, after the pandemic, like, you know, there, there's been changes in the nature of connecting with people, mm -hmm. um, and I think we're in the midst of, in a, of, of a new sort of season, a new generation of, like, connecting with people, and what does that mean for, um, for the future, um, and how can we, you know, make those authentic connections build those authentic mm. connections and make sure that they are um, sustained over time. Mm. Yeah, I think this is really important in the climate conversation because mm. global warming often yeah. devalues the yeah. local. It's like, oh, we got to, you know, this right. big scale. If it doesn't scale, it's meaningless. Mm -hmm. And I think that, yes. you know, that old bumper sticker that, you know, think global, think. act locally kind of ought mm -hmm. to be revived because the, the global warming conversation pulls us away to this mm -hmm. macro level that I think mm -hmm. it gets us yes. away from, from where we are and the people closest to us. As we wrap up, whether I'm a scientist or not, how can I get involved in working to solve environmental problems in my community, Dan? You know, what, what's a... Yeah, okay, so the first thing you do is uh, start where you live, okay? And I think, I th in fact, I just was writing, uh, jotting some notes on the flight out here, trying to do some good work today for that carbon offset for the carbon that I contributed going into the atmosphere by taking a jet plane here from Kansas City. But I thought about this idea of community and how 
many people don't live in communities anymore. They live in subdivisions. They live in gated communities. So I'm going to start real simple. Build a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Know your neighbors mm -hmm. so you can talk to them about what you can do to improve the air quality, the land quality, reduce waste, improve, you know, your carbon footprint, reduce it. These are community issues. They're place issues. And I think there's good work to be done there. So start by if you don't know your neighbors, even if you're in an apartment building, knock on the door and say, hey, you want to have coffee sometime? Let's just visit. Let's get to know each other. I think the biggest enemy we have right now to community science is the fact increasing numbers of people live in anonymity in very large urban areas. Mm -hmm. And folks, we can't afford to be anonymous anymore. Right. We need yeah. to know our neighbors. Ask, if you have an induction cooktop, invite people to come over and see how cool your induction cooktop is or yeah, there something you go. like that. Yep. Uh, it cleans up the air. Angela, what can people do? Well, I, I, I live in a neighborhood where people know me now as the tree lady. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would just have to send, uh, yeah. um, echo that. But um, be incremental in change. Mm. Uh, because nothing is going to happen overnight in grand scale. So start small and build incrementally. And that's that has been the part of the Success for Healthy Community mm -hmm. Services by realizing that everyone has a, a role to play, whether you're a homeowner or a renter, um, black, white. And my neighborhood is changing because we're, we're getting um, more of a Hispanic population now as a result of the changes from Hurricane Katrina. So we're still feeling the, the changes from Hurricane Katrina and gentrification. And so we no longer, it's no longer a neighborhood of family and, and, and things of that nature. So we as a community have to adjust and realize that everyone is involved in this issue. And so it's, it's been, for me, it's been rewarding to see the change and I embrace being a tree lady. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's what I do. Um, again, it's incumbent upon me um, to, to be able to make those changes. But most importantly, Listen to young people and mm. bring them together with the elders so that together the technology and the mm. wisdom can come together. Mm. And that, yeah. that would be the thing that I would say too. Get the young people off their screens and with the elders yes. like yeah. that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Natasha, Dan, and Angela, thank you so much for sharing your insights here on Climate One.